praise team. And good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you and have you on this Memorial Day weekend. I am sure that many of you have plans for your weekend. That will include gathering with friends and family, maybe both, and enjoying a day in which we as a country recognize men and women who have served this country well, men and women who have made the ultimate sacrifice by giving their lives so that we can, in fact, experience the freedoms that we have so much enjoyed throughout our lifetimes. So thank you for coming and joining us. And I invite you at this time, if you would, to bow with me for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you this morning to be able to come and to sing about you, to sing praises to you. We thank you, Lord, that it is you who provides man with hope. That it's the local church that you use as a conduit to be a mouthpiece for you to share that hope with others. But it's you who saves. We ask this morning as we open up your word, that as your church, we would listen, we would take to heart, we would be compelled to love you great, more greatly than we have than before for having been here, that our desire would be to serve you more faithfully, and that, Lord, we would take to heart the fact that you call us to be a people or to be active for you, empowered by your Holy Spirit, yes, and, Lord, that you can bring good about. We ask that you would just bless our time, that, Lord, we would uh, allow for you to have our undivided attention when we pray these things beautiful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You were with us last week. We were talking the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 5, and we were looking at the fact that when justification takes place by faith, it carries with it many, many blessings. Just real a quick recap of those blessings are that we experience peace with God, that we are people who have access to God through faith in Him, that we get to experience joy in the midst of our sufferings because we know that God is bringing about good in our lives and Christ-like character and preparing us for the future with Him, that we have hope in Christ and that we who know Jesus Christ are indwelt upon our profession of faith with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it's not you and I trying to live this life on our own, but empowered by the Holy Spirit Himself. This morning, we're going to pick up in verse 12. So if you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 5. And we'll be beginning here shortly in verse 12. As we do this, Paul begins to share with us at this juncture in chapter 5. That Adam's sin is something that affected all people. Just as Jesus Christ's obedience has affected all who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and are believers in Him. So here's a question I pose to you this morning. How does it come about that all men, and I use that generically, men and women, are in fact sinners? I think it's a question that everybody has to wrestle with. And Paul, what he does in answering that question is he takes us all the way back to the first man, Adam, found back in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. And he does this to affirm the fact that the sin that took place there in chapter 3 was something that affected all mankind. And as a result, every human being will experience then sin in their life and left unchecked will result in death. Now you say, I'm so glad I came this morning. I am so affirmed and built up and encouraged by those words. Well, hang in there. We're going to get to that part, okay? Now, at the same time, Paul's going to share how the power of Jesus Christ and his act of obedience by going to the cross where he died for the sins of man is really the key thing throughout this paragraph. 
So if you haven't already turned in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, I encourage you again to do so and look with me and follow with me as I read verses 12 through 14. Therefore, just as sin entered into the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did. It was a pattern of the one to come. If you notice in these three verses, Paul, as he's writing, doesn't refer to Adam and he doesn't refer to Christ by name. He referred to each of them as one man. You put your finger there and you turn with me back to 1 Corinthians. You guys don't have this in the back, so don't panic. Chapter 15, verse 22, it reads like this. As for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Then you drop down to verse 45, and it tells us there. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit, referring to, of course, Jesus Christ. So Paul doesn't call them by name. He refers to them as one man. It's interesting, if you were to go through verses 12 through 21, you will find the word one in there 14 different times. And so as the Apostle Paul viewed Adam and Christ, he was referring to them as federal heads of two groups of people. What in the world are you talking about? Let me define a federal head for you. It's a person who acts as a representative of many others and whose actions result in consequences that the individuals he represents inevitably experience. Examples of federal heads that you and I would understand are things like a king or a president or a parent. And let me illustrate. I like football, so I'll go with football. You guys are there in a stadium, high school, college, professional, doesn't matter. And you have two individuals that make their way out to the center of the field before the game starts. The referees are out there. They'll introduce the team captain from this team to the team captain of the other team. They'll shake hands and then they'll look at the one and say, okay, I'm gonna flip a coin you call heads or tails. Now, both of those captains represent their team. And the one who calls, maybe he says heads, the coin slipped and it comes up tails. They lost the toss, but the whole team lost the toss. The representative was out there, but the whole team had to experience the consequences of his choice, his decision. And in this particular passage, Paul was not looking at what individual sinners themselves have done as he has in time prior in this letter. But now what he's doing is he's looking at Adam and specifically the fall of Adam and how that impacted mankind as a whole. Compared to what Jesus Christ did when he went to the cross and how the impact of what his obedience provided for all who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ that believers does for them. So let's begin by looking at the impact of Abraham or Adam's sin. We know that Adam acts were acts that resulted in his descendants sinning and dying. We inherit Adam's nature. It's a nature that is sinful. And this accounts for the fact that we all sin, and as a result of our sin, it ultimately leads to our death, apart from a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're sinners not only because we commit acts of sin, but we are sinners because of Adam's sin and the fact that it corrupted the entire human race. 
as a result, it made sin and punishment inevitable for all his descendants as well as for himself. In sharp contrast to that, we have Jesus Christ. His act of willingly going and dying. Dying for your sins and mine. And as a result of his death, what he accomplished was God's purpose. And God raises up another. I'm sorry. And, and what that does is that it provides for mankind a righteousness that cannot be found apart from what Jesus Christ did for us. It's interesting when you go through the scriptures that oftentimes we'll read about an individual who failed and then God raises up another one to follow them and replace them. You saw that with Moses and his failure in leading those in the wilderness and God replaces him with a man by the name of Joshua to lead the people into the promised land. You saw that with David when Saul himself failed. You saw that with Elisha replacing Elijah. And in the text here we see Adam's failure led to God raising up his son Jesus Christ who would come and resolve the problem that man had because of sin. Now, Adam's sin was something that resulted in his descendants inheriting the sinful human nature. It resulted in our being born into a state of sinfulness. My ancestors on my father's side immigrated to the United States from Slovakia. My mom's ancestors immigrated to the United States from Italy. Now, I had nothing to do with them immigrating to the United States. But as a result of their choice to immigrate to the United States, my father and mother and all my siblings and all my children have been born here in the United States as a result of the choices that my ancestors have made. And so here we see Adam's decision, a decision that was to move into a state of sin resulted in all of his descendants being born in a state of sin. John Calvin, he believed very much that the Bible taught original sin, and this is what he writes. Quote, original sin therefore seems to be a hereditary depravity and corruption of our nature, diffused into all parts of our soul, which first makes us liable to God's wrath, and it also brings forth in us those works that the scripture calls works of the flesh. And so what Paul does is in verses 13 and 14, he shares with us that people, keep in mind, the law did not come until the time of Moses, and so from the beginning, with Adam all the way up to the time of Moses, that was a big period of time. The law had not yet been given to Moses. The Mosaic law did not exist up until that point. And yet he says, if there is no law, there can be no transgression of law. But here's the reality. If death is the penalty that comes from transgression of the law, why did these people die during that period leading up to the Mosaic Law being given? The answer is they died because they sinned in Adam. Now we know that when you read through the book of Genesis, chapter 3, actually beginning in 2, God was abundantly clear with Adam as to what his expectations were. He told him what his parameters were. And he even went so far as to tell them that if you choose to go outside of those parameters, here are the consequences that are going to follow. And they're severe. It's going to be death. Spiritual death. Separation from God. But what we see play out in chapter 3 of Genesis is that Adam, knowing what God had said to him, it was abundantly clear what God said. He deliberately made a choice 
And he deliberately chose to go outside of the bounds that God had given him. And as a result of the sin that took place there in the Garden of Eden, all of Adam's descendants have disobeyed God's moral law as well. This accounts for the reality that there is universal death. Why is it that little babies die? Because we're all born with a sin nature. The rest of this chapter, the rest of these verses play out as Paul develops seven different contrasts between Adam and that of Christ. Adam's act compared to the act of Christ and his obedience where he gave his life on the cross of Calvary. Look at verse 15, if you would. He writes there, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. The first contrast he provides are the acts. With Adam, we have his trespass in the Garden of Eden, contrasted with Christ's act of righteousness on the cross of Calvary. And Paul here in this verse uses this phrase, the many. It's interesting, that can mean, in the case of Adam, it does mean, the many meaning all humanity all mankind. But when it comes to Christ, the many is a reference to all the people who by faith accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They're the ones who will receive the benefits of his saving act of faith. Now the effects of Jesus Christ in his act on people was different from that of Adam's. And it was far superior. That's why Paul uses this phrase much more to indicate it. You see, Jesus Christ did not only cancel the effects of the sins that resulted from Adam, but the grace of Christ not only brings physical life, but it brings spiritual life. It brings abundant life. And that's why when we read in John chapter 10, verse 10, that Jesus Christ said, I came that they may have life and have it to the full, or have it abundantly. In other words, Jesus Christ provided more than Adam had ever lost or possessed before the fall, and that's the righteousness of God made available to you and I through Jesus Christ and Him alone. There's a second contrast, and that's the results. We read about that in verse 16. It says, nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. Judgment followed by one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. In Adam's case, the single sin by a single individual, this man, was sufficient to bring condemnation to what? The human race. But in Christ, this one act of his obedience was sufficient to bring justification to all who by faith believe in Jesus Christ. And here's the verdict that came. Adam's act of sin brought condemnation. Christ's act of obedience brought justification. When Adam sinned, he was declared unrighteous and condemned. When Christ Followed through with his act of obedience. He was he's justified, declared righteous before God. That is, anyone who places their faith and trust in him. The third contrast we see in our text is the consequences. The consequences. And we read about those consequences in verse 17. It's contrasting the consequence of death with the consequence of life. For those in Christ. Verse 17. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man. 
how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in the life through one man, Jesus Christ? The consequence of Adam's sin was death. Death reigning over all mankind. In sharp contrast to that, the consequence we see of Christ's obedience was mankind, which I'm referring here and Scripture is talking about here, the believer in Christ, reigning over death. Drastically different. It implies that the believer's ultimate resurrection and participation in Jesus Christ's reign as well as his reigning in this life. In Adam, we lost our kingship. In Christ, in Christ we reign as kings. Radically different from one another. And our spiritual reign in Christ is by far, infinitely by far, more than Adam's earthly reign ever was. There's a fourth contrast that Paul points out, and that's this, the extent of Adam's act and Christ's act. We read about that in verse 18. He says, Consequently, just as a result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. Paul says, Adam's act brought condemnation upon all men, but Christ's act brought justification upon all men who believe in Christ. Now there are three reasons why all human beings, except for Christ, are guilty before God. The first reason is God imputed Adam's guilt to each of his descendants. That is referred to as original sin. The second reason that all human beings are guilty before God is that every human being is born with a human nature that has been defiled by sin. That's called our sin nature. The next time you're around a 12 month old, pick them up. Maybe they go to do something and you say no and you see that little, beautiful, precious child who melted your heart when you first picked them up cock back with their hand and strike you right across the face. Did you teach them that? No. Sinful nature is alive and well. As a parent, I never had to teach my kids how to sin. I had to teach them how to be obedient to the Word of God, how to love, just like my parents taught me. But I never had to teach them how to sin because we all have a sin nature. But there's a third reason as to why all human beings are guilty before God, and that's this, that every single person commits sin. We call that personal sin. This is an individual matter, and that's why we read in Romans chapter 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Who does all include, church? There are no exceptions. We're all in that same camp. We all are a people who experience original sin. We are all people with a sin nature. And we are all people who have personal sin. And as a result... We, in fact, are all guilty before God because of our sin. Well, Paul goes on, and there's a next contrast that he shares, and that's the issues. The issues involved in Abraham or Adam's act versus Christ's act, and we read about that in verse 19. Paul continues, and he says, For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Constantly keeping in mind, he's talking about Adam, the one man, and Christ. The first Adam, the second Adam. 
And so he shares with them here in verse 19 the issue. Here's the issue. Adam flat out and deliberately disobeyed God. He directly went against what God had said and instructed him to do. Christ, on the other hand, was completely obedient to God. The word transgression and, or trespass that we read about in verses 15, 16, and 17 was something that highlights this deliberate, intentional disobedience that Adam had. In fact, if we go back to Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, I just want to read those so that we have the context. He says there, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Pretty clear? Come on, church. Pretty clear? Yes. I'd say so. Straightforward, to the point. Adam, listen. He heard what God said. And then he decided to go ahead and do things differently than what God had instructed him to do. He decided that he would push the envelope, that he would go beyond the limit that God had given him. And then the reality is this. God tested Adam. And Adam failed. Now in sharp contrast to that, Paul goes on in this verse and he points out the fact of the obedience of Christ. We know that it's the obedience of Christ, the reference to his death that Paul is talking about. This act of obedience that was necessary in order for you and I to be able to sit here today and know that we are saved because Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price by laying his life down and paying for your sins and mine in full. The reality is our union with Adam made us sinners. However, our union with Christ enables you and I to have a brand new kind of life. A righteous life of obedience to God. Which just leads us to the next contrast, and that's the contrast itself found in verse 20. The law was added so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Between here is the contrast between the law and grace. One of the purposes, and we've been looking at this throughout the study through the book of Romans, one of the reasons God gave the law to the Jewish people was to reveal to the Jewish people their sinfulness. The law exposed the sinfulness of man. The law is very clear. It's very plain. You deviate from it, you violate it. Just like we have law today in our land. If you don't want to do what the law says, don't be surprised if it leads to trouble and consequences. But the other thing the law served to do is reveal how desperate man is for the grace of God. When I realized the sorry state that I am in, in my sinfulness, I realized how desperately I need the grace of God. I realized my lostness. I realized how depraved I really am I realize I can't clean up my life on my own. God never intended for me to. He sent his son to do what you and I could never do for us. When God provided Jesus Christ, he very much provided grace. Grace that far, far exceeded the sin that the law exposed. The law was something that showed the significance of Adam's sin more clearly. And God's provision of Christ showed the significance of God's grace more clearly. 
That leads us to the last contrast found in verse 21, and that's the dominions. The dominions of Adam's act and Christ's act. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Adam's act was something that resulted in sin reigning in death. On the other hand, Christ's act resulted in grace reigning to eternal life. I think, church, as you read through this, you realize this is some, some real difficult stuff to, to really mull over and process. But while each of us here stands guilty before God because of, Adam, because of all of Adam's descendants are sinners due to Adam's sin, the reality is Jesus Christ came and through his act of obedience, where he went to the cross and he died, his righteousness has removed both causes of, for condemnation. The first cause is the guilt of our own personal sin. Jesus Christ paid him in full. And the second cause for condemnation that Jesus dealt with was the punishment for Adam's sin. He took the punishment your sin and my sin upon himself. When you stop and you think about who we really are, just think about this past week. Think about some of the thoughts that went through your mind. It's thoughts that maybe you thought, I can't believe I'm thinking this way. Maybe some of the words that you spewed out of your mouth Some of the actions that you demonstrate. You say, yeah, I realize I'm a sinner. But if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're also convicted by that. Those things. And you know, wait a minute. Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price for me. The least I can do is to truly live my life for him. And he's given me everything I need to do that. He's given me the word of God, truth. Not just to sit on a shelf. Not just to lay on my nightstand. But to take and to process and to live out. He's given me the Holy Spirit who lives within me. To empower me and to enable me. To live life radically different than I did prior to knowing Jesus Christ. And victory can be found as we go to him, turn to him, and allow for him to work in us and to work through us. I guess it's only right and fitting that Memorial Day weekend to talk about a passage like this. Where the ultimate sacrifice was made to free you and I up in the truest sense of the word. The ultimate sacrifice was made so that you and I could experience life and life to the full. And it's all because of the incredible grace of Jesus Christ. One who is willing to leave his rightful place in heaven, to take upon himself flesh, become a man, and to be ultimately nailed to a cross where he would die for your sin and for mine. And afford you and I the opportunity of being made right before God. And it's all because of Christ. It's only because of Christ that's possible. Do you know him? Maybe you're here this morning and the reality is is you come maybe to church sometimes. You can talk the talk, the Christianese. You can maybe even pull the wool over people's eyes around you. 
Truth is, God sees everything, and he knows you completely. But he's saying, apart from me, you're in trouble. But I came. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. I came to provide you life and life to the full. And it only happens as we acknowledge our condition before God, acknowledge who He is and what He's done for us, and then accept that precious gift of salvation that He extends to us. Not because of you and me, not because of our efforts, it's because of Jesus Christ and Him alone, that we can experience a right relationship with God. I'm going to ask if you would just bow your heads for a moment and close your eyes. We do have a responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. The reality is none of us can save another person. But we have been given the charge to share the hope that we have with others. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we're available for you to talk with. We'd love the chance to talk with you. As believers, I hope we take to heart what we have in Christ. I hope we take to heart the reality of what He has provided us with. I hope we live our lives honor and please him to the full, knowing that we've been given all the resources to do all that he's called us to do. Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. Lord, thank you for Jesus Christ, for his coming to make right the wrong that was going on in all of our lives. To come and to provide for us The incredible grace that you extend. So we can sit here today as men and women whose lives are changed and are continuing to be changed and transform more and more into your likeness all the time. And it's all because of the obedience of your Son and our Savior Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Father, thank you for loving us that way. Thank you for providing for us that way. We love you. We praise you. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, I pray. All God's people say, Amen. Amen.